It's Brian Preston, the money guy. Let's first talk about, Bo, an overview of the world of financial advisors. Yeah, so we actually went and looked at the numbers, and we were kind of surprised because it looks like right now there are 271,700 financial advisors in the U.S., and this is all this data we're compiling is from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the CFP. Board, that number went and down. Alpha. I was actually surprised by it that. It was down too. 200 employee, uh, 200 financial advisors since we did this like two, two and a half years ago. So I wonder if that's folks retiring. I wonder if that's mergers. I wonder what the thing is that's caused that to go down. But I mean, it wasn't. A, it could be a rounding error in the way they calculated. It, but it was 200 people. So we have 271,000, almost 272,000 financial advisors out there. Well, of that. 86,378 of those are CFP professionals, certified financial planners. And we'll talk a second about what that is and why it matters. But for right now, we just think that's the prerequisite. That's kind of the baseline. If you want to be a financial advisor, you should be a CFP. And then what we also thought was interesting is uh, one of the things, the terms that we're going to talk about is how advisors get paid. Well, about 1.4% or only 3,700 of those 272,000 advisors are fee-only advisors. That's us. We're the unicorns. That's right. And that's what I explain it. When I go talk to college capstone classes and others, we say, we're the unicorns. So, you know, this is, this is, we're a little unique. And that's what, it's probably, if we're going to explain that we're the unicorns with only 3,700 fee-only advisors, you're probably wondering, because look, you're realizing very quickly, and I know this is not, they're not inclusive of all the numbers right. here, but it's still a pretty good point that only a third of people have gone out and got the professional certification. I mean, when you work with a public accountant, you kind of assume that you're they're, they're on the road to getting their CPA That's license. Right. Um, somehow in financial planning, it doesn't work that way because you can see the lion's share, close to 70% of people. And, that, and that's the thing I've always hated about this industry. Anybody can call themselves a financial planner. You yep. can basically go sh hang a shingle outside your front door and say, open for business. What do I need to do? Mm -hmm. So let's kind of go a little deeper so people know what the requirements are, what the standards are, and what the education kind of things that you ought to look for. So we think inside the financial planning world, there are really sort of three distinct business models that you ought to know about. And kind of the thing that differentiates visor, advisors, at least for the most part, is kind of how they're compensated. Yeah. That's a real easy way to see the difference between different types of advisors. So, Bo, let's let's kind of roll into these different types because, and, and here's the cool thing: I come from a background where I worked actually worked in two of these camps. Bo, you've worked in one of these camps, mm -hmm, so I, I think have. we've got all three covered. Yep, that's exactly so, right. So let's kind of jump into these. So the very first one is the commission-based business model. Very simple, simply, these are advisors that are paid commissions for the products they sell. So a lot of times you see this with like loaded mutual funds or insurance companies. They sell you insurance policy ABC or mutual fund XYZ, and they receive a company a commission from the company whose products they are selling. And so you, you just said something that just triggered something that I hear people say. People were told sometimes about people that are pushing products is, don't worry, this is actually free to you. Mm -hmm. I am paid by the insurance company. That's, I'm paid by right. the brokerage company. Oh, that drives me nuts, by it, the way. It is, it is a pet peeve. So I, I just want you to know, you realize the price of the product that they're selling does. So they're even though the insurance company is paying them, you ultimately are bearing that cost. That's so right. just know that that's a sales tactic. It's a little sleight of hand. I don't want you to fall victim to that. That's exactly right. Uh, the second one, so we have commission. Well, the very next business model is the fee-based business model. And so what this means is it's an advisor who's sort of paid through a combination. This is a hybrid. They receive some portion in fees, but they also do receive commissions as well. When I worked on the, when I, before I went fee only, mm -hmm. I worked for a CPA firm that we were more of the fee-based model because we sold life insurance. We also did financial planning and investment management. We did a lot annuities. of annuities, wrap accounts. Mm -hmm. We dabbled in annuities, sure. but really we were wrap account advisors. And when I say wrap account, it's it's the fact that we would go buy commissioned mutual funds, but we would waive the commissions that mm -hmm. the mutual fund companies would pay and then charge a, a, an assets under management sure. type fee. We'd still get some, some trails that might have changed because I've been out of that game for two decades, sure. 
But at the time, you you, you waived a lot of the commissions, but it did allow you. So you did kind of look like a fee only advisor mm-hmm. in the fact that you're getting paid under like assets under management or some retainer model, mm-hmm. but you still kept your right to go sell a life insurance product or something and get commissions and get paid. So you're getting paid both commissions as well as some type of fee structure. That's right. And so then the third, and this is the one that we alluded to, this is what we call kind of the unicorns, are the fee only. Essentially, the way a fee only advisor gets paid is directly from the clients they work with. So there's no outside company or third party paying them. They get paid directly from the client. And generally speaking, it's either through like an hourly model or a retainer model or an assets under management type model. Yeah. And and think about that because I think we have a lot of people that reach out If you're thinking about by the hour, that means you have an engagement that you think you just had a a, a need that's going to go away after the project's over. Retainer means you maybe you pay an annual fee. It's the same fee. And then asset center management, that is the majority of your bigger firms are going to be AUM, which means that they do take a percentage of the assets that they're actually adding value or managing for you. That's exactly right. But even inside there, it gets even a little more nuanced. We'll kind of talk about that in a second. So the next thing I like to to kind of, because I want to keep this rolling, Mm -hmm. I don't want to overwhelm people, but I want to make sure we keep it going, is understanding the difference between financial planning standards. Because there are two big camps, and I think the public is clueless Mm -hmm. on this. There was a big battle in Washington, and I bet we could walk down to the streets of Franklin, Tennessee, and... Not any of the 10 people we first uh-huh. asked would be like, what do you know about suitability rules? And they would be like, I don't know. What? How about a fiduciary standard? They'd be like, what's that? Never heard of it. And by the way, I still have trouble spelling fiduciary. So this is a legit <laughs> issue. So it's, it's one of those things that I think that the public has definitely got a disconnect. So we want to kind of open that up a little bit. And so what I thought was beautiful, Brian, is I think we ought to define both of them. So I'll kind of read yep. the definitions. But then I want you to share what they actually mean, because I've heard you do this 10,000 times, and I think you do it really, really well. So the suitability standard requires that a broker makes recommendations that are just suitable for the client situation. It doesn't necessarily have to be in their best interest. It just can't be grossly negligent. Yeah, because they're selling you a product. That's right. So then when we think about the fiduciary standard, it requires an advisor put the client's best interests ahead of their own, and they adhere to the RIA and it's forced by the SEC. So here's the illustration I always give people on this. Is, and this is, the older I get, the more sensitive I've come to what I put in my body and what I eat. Because they just have to pay attention. Because I know that healthier I eat, the cleaner I'm going to live, and yep. the probably longer I'll live. And that's all important. Well, it's kind of like that with money. You would think that you want to have the best things working for your long-term success financially. Here's the problem, though. Suitability. All it means, it doesn't have to be in your best interest. It doesn't even have to be the best product. You just have to fit into the term of suitable. So here's here's the perfect analogy. Candy. Every time you go to the movies and you get your Twizzlers, you get your your peanut M&Ms, and we'll throw the popcorn in there too, and the Coke, we'll throw it all in there. They can sell that, and the FDA and everybody hasn't shut that. The government hasn't shut them down because... Even though it's not healthy to eat popcorn, candy, and Twizzlers and everything else, it is suitable for human consumption. Yeah, it'll keep you alive. It's it, suitable. It'll it do it that. is suitable, meaning it's not going to kill you right now. But over the long term, it's not good for you. So a nutritionist who is probably, you go hire a nutritionist and they're going to put together a diet and they're going to tell you calorie intake, how your metabolic process is. They're never, ever going to say, it's not going to be unless it's your cheat day or it's something that gets you motivated. They're not going to tell you. They're not. They're going to throw suitability out the window, and they're going to actually tell you what the best foods, mm-hmm. you're probably going to eat a lot more broccoli under a fiduciary standard That's than exactly you right. would with a suitability. Now, look, in the short term, it's going to be a lot more fun you know, getting sold because they're going to wine and dine you. They might even buy you a steak dinner if you go see their seminar. But I can tell you, long term, fiduciary where you have a legal obligation to put the clients in your best in- their interest ahead of your own mm-hmm. is going to be much better in the long term. Yeah, and we've just always liked that because what it naturally allows you to do is it just removes some of that guesswork. Whenever you go into a financial advising relationship, you are naturally kind of on edge. You're yeah. inviting someone in to just the deepest, darkest part of your life. And normally for most folks, it's kind of a taboo subject. So if you know the person on the other side of the table is required by the law to act in your best interest, it allows you to at least let your guard down a little bit. Um, Another thing that I think gets confusing for the public, certification, letters after your name, because it has gotten to the point, and and I was like, well, when we do this show, if I just talk about what we have, people are going to think that's very self-serving. Yep. So I'm very tense, very sensitive to that. So I said, what we're going to do is 
I'm going to go actually find a third party, something that everybody's heard of, and see if they have an article. So I typed in, and I, you know, I said, what's the credentials, the, the best credentials for a financial advisor? And there was an article that popped right up. And it was the top three financial advisor credentials according to Investopedia. Okay. So this is a source. And I did this because you and I don't completely agree on this. There is some dissension so amongst the Money Guy the team The first on this. one I will read is the Certified Financial Planner designation. I'm going to read this quote for quote because I don't want you to think that I made something or added to it to, to make our point. But here's what Investopedia says about CFPs. Okay. Quote, a certified financial planner, a CFP, is bound by rigorous requirements set by the Certified Financial Planner Board of Standards, the CFP board. There are four parts to the initial CFP certification, education, examination, experience, and ethics. A CFP candidate will need to put in up to 1,000 hours to complete the required coursework and the exam. The CFP applicant must have a minimal education level of a bachelor's degree in coursework in financial planning. The ethics component requires the applicant to meet the fitness standards for candidates and registrants and promises to follow the rules of conduct, which, conduct, which put the client's interest First. So you have to have a bachelor's degree, you have to put in the time to have passed an approved curriculum, you have to pass the test, and then you even have to have experience doing it, and you have to agree to be bound by the code of ethics. The, the fiduciary obligation, right. essentially. So that's good. So that's that's the CFP. Now, I think it's interesting. So this one, we, we're not battling yet. It's not it's not a battle of us. Um, keeping my, my mouth we closed. We are both CFPs. That is correct. Can we both agree we like the CFP We like the CFP. We consider that sort of a prerequisite for doing this for a living. We encourage all of our young associates to pursue the CFP designation. We think it's a solid one. So let me move to where it's not questionable because, look, I, I poke fun at Bo, but this is actually legit, and I'm proud of him for having this. I kind of bullied him into doing it. So the next one is Chartered Financial Analyst, and here's what it says about Chartered Financial Analyst. Quote, the prestigious Investing credential of Chartered Financial Analyst, CFA, is issued by the internationally recognized CFA Institute. The CFA is especially important in the areas of investment research and portfolio management. Similar to the CFP, there are rigorous ed educational experience and examination requirements for the CFA. It continues a little further. This is the part you probably go like. And this continued, quote, to become a regular member of CFA Institute, you will need to hold a bachelor's degree from an accredited institution or have equivalent education or work experience, according to the CFA Institute website. The CFA holder must also have 48 months of related professional work experience in investment-related field. That's almost 10,000 hours because, mm -hmm. you know, another year. The most challenging aspect of attaining the CFA certification are the three required examinations. Each are six hours and must be taken over several years. The CFA examination test topics from these disciplines, accounting, economics, ethics, finance, and mathematics. It's a deep dive for investment nerds. That that's what I would say the CFA is. It's a deep dive for investment nerds. Okay. I, I don't want you I don't want your head to swell up too much. That test is legit. Because there are three tests. <laughs> And the pass rates on each of them, the highest is like, is it? Do they even make fifty percent? I think I think level three got to like fifty one percent once you made it past the first. So two. think about that. People, every test has around a fifty percent pass rate, but as you go deeper, so imagine you make it through the first cut, you pass the mm -hmm. CFA one exam, right? Fifty percent or somewhere, somewhere probably more like thirty. Than that. It was like thirties in the in the level one. It goes like thirties, forties, and then fifties or around that. So only thirty percent some yeah. of them pass. Okay, yeah. at so, least in my exam cycle. So then you get to exam two. So you're like made it through the first cut, and then you get to exam two, and only forty something percent something make it like through that. that. Yeah. of the people who pass of the, the first one. The first and one. then you get to the last one, and. It's 50% of everybody who passed one and two. Yeah. And we know people who've passed two and mm -hmm. just gave up after the third one. They were like, I can't do this anymore. And that's why I do want to give Bo credit because he passed all three on his first ex first try. And he passed it, the last one, at three, a week before his wedding. So kudos to you. <laughs> it was, I was happy to, happy to be done with it. But I want to give credit where credit's due because we could just stop there and talk about how wonderful my designations are, which are great. But I was surprised, and I'm happy you did this because I thought it was cherry picking. And when I went to check your research, it was not cherry picking. There was a third designation that was listed, and that designation was indeed the personal financial specialist. And this is what it says: the personal financial specialist is credentialed by the highly regarded American Institute of Certified Public Accountants. 
This profession, uh, professional designation, uh, this is, profession is a I certified accountant. I didn't screw up when I read yours, by the way. With additional expertise in all aspects of financial <laughs> and wealth management. The PFA studies estate planning, retirement planning, investing, insurance, and additional areas of personal financial planning. This designation also requires three years work experience, rigorous continuing professional education, and high ethical standards. Similar to the prior high-level certifications, the PFS must pass an exam. So it, too, is obviously a highly regarded, well-respected All that blowhardness to basically say a CPA that does financial CPA planning. That that's what that's what it is. And, and look, like I said, I get weird about this because it just so happens the three credentials that they used at Investopedia are the ones. And I think those are, if you ask me what are my the ones mm-hmm. that I get most respect when I see them, it is the CFP, CPA, you could say p- slash PFS, yep. and the CFA, Absolutely. which you have. I don't, the rest are, I look at as a lot of alphabetical soup that a lot of organizations that are trying to sell stuff do. And give so, out. some of them, you go pay a hundred bucks and you get it. So here's, here's the takeaway from that. If you're working with an advisor, if you're thinking about hiring an advisor, make sure you understand what the designations behind their name are. And just because they have a lot of them doesn't necessarily mean that they're good ones. You want to go do your own research there. And also you understand their education background. You heard a lot of them are required a bachelor's degree. Yep. Find out what that bachelor's degree in. Find out how long they've been doing this. Remember, I just did a show earlier where I talked about how I screwed up my parents' own account mm-hmm. because you know, who do you typically go hit up first when you don't have Family clients? Family and friends. Family and friends. Go blow it up on them. So you need 10,000 hours of expertise you know, I'd like you to have even more if you've got some assets behind you. So it's just understand what you're getting into. 